Hey what's up, Merite here. In this video, we're going to go through the anatomy of the peritoneum, which is a serious membrane that lines the inside of the abdominal wall, as well as surrounding various organs we have inside the abdominal cavity. So in this video, we're first going to go through the parts of the peritoneum, then we're going to go through the lesser and greater omentum and the mesentery. After that, we'll go through the different structures you will find in the peritoneal cavity. So now, now that we've covered the anatomy of the organs in the abdominal cavity, we need something to protect them. And that's what the peritoneum does. It's a serious coat that protects and fixes the organ in place and forms a serious coat around the organs for a smooth and wet environment in the abdominal cavity. Now, let's start by making a vertical cut of the abdominal cavity and look at it from this perspective. You will see this view, right? Now for orientation's sake, you'll find the liver, the stomach, and here is the transverse colon, and then we got the small intestine, and the sigmoid colon of the large intestine down here. And uh, this is a woman's abdominal cavity, so the womb is here. Alright, so let's start by adding a perfectly drawn diaphragm. So the peritoneum consists of only two parts. The first part is the parietal peritoneum, as you see here in green. The parietal peritoneum lines the internal surface of the abdominal and the pelvic wall and it's kind of a three-dimensional. If you imagine it starts anteriorly at the anterior abdominal wall and then wraps around the lateral abdominal wall and then connects at the posterior abdominal wall. So that's the parietal peritoneum along the internal surface of the abdominal and the pelvic wall. The second part is called the visceral peritoneum which lines the walls of the organs, forming a wet and serious coat, as you see here in yellow. And between these two, we have a cavity called the peritoneal cavity, or cavitas peritonealis in Latin, which contains a serious fluid that is produced by the serious membrane. So, the visceral and the parietal peritoneum produces a fluid that fills the cavity between them. We're going to go through all of these in detail, starting with the visceral peritoneum. And we're going to do that by answering the question, how does the visceral peritoneum cover the organs? So, there are three ways the visceral peritoneum covers the organs, and they are visualized in this transverse section of the abdominal cavity. Organs within our abdomen are categorized based on how the visceral peritoneum covers them. The first type of internal organs are the intraperitoneal viscera, and these are organs that are completely invested by the visceral peritoneum, as you see here in blue. Um, here I've listed all the internal organs that are completely invested by the visceral peritoneum. These include the stomach, the spleen back here, the cecum and the appendix, the transverse colon, the sigmoid colon, and the upper part of the rectum, and the jejunum and the ileum of the small intestine. So, if I ask you, what kind of an organ is the stomach, you would say? It's an intraperitoneal organ. Awesome. Another type of organs we have are the mesoperitoneal organs, which are the internal organs covered by the visceral peritoneum from three different sides, as you see here. Here I've listed all the organs that are partially invested by the visceral peritoneum. We got the liver, you know, due to the bare area, the gallbladder, the ascending and the descending colon, a middle part of the rectum, and also the urinary bladder is, is partially covered by the peritoneum when it's full. And then we have the retroperitoneal organs. These organs are covered by the visceral peritoneum from only one side. And here I've listed all the organs that are covered by the peritoneum from one side. This includes the duodenum, the pancreas, the kidneys and their suprarenal glands. Um, then the ureter and also the urinary bladder is also covered by the visceral peritoneum from only one side when it's empty. So now that we've looked at how the visceral peritoneum covers the organs, we need to know the course of the peritoneum, meaning what is the relation between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum? How does the peritoneum go? So the parietal peritoneum, you know, the one that covers the inner surface of the abdominal and the pelvic wall, continues as the visceral peritoneum through these four ligaments up here in this area. So the first ligament by which the parietal peritoneum continues into the visceral peritoneum is this one, the falciform ligament or ligamentum falciforme, connecting the visceral peritoneum on the liver to the parietal peritoneum on the anterior abdominal wall. So let's put a check mark there. Then we have to remove the diaphragm to see the other ligaments. 
you will see the ligamentum coronarium or the coronary ligament connecting the liver to the parietal peritoneum under the diaphragm. So let's check that one as well. And don't forget that you're able to see the bare area from this point. Now, if we turn the liver around, you will still have the coronary ligament and the bare area, right? On the right side of the coronary ligament, we have the right triangular ligament. So let's check that one. And a left triangular ligament here on the left. So all of these ligaments connect the visceral peritoneum to the parietal peritoneum. Now from the liver, the ligaments of the visceral peritoneum are going to continue down and cover the liver as the visceral peritoneum, right? And also don't forget that in front of it, there's the parietal peritoneum covering everything along the inner surface of the abdominal wall. Now the visceral peritoneum is going to continue down from the liver and connect to other organs under it. And all the ligaments under the liver we call them the lesser omentum. So everything under the liver, but above the lesser curvature of the stomach, is the lesser omentum. So the ligaments of the lesser omentum under the liver are two. So two ligaments make up the lesser omentum. So the first one is the hepatogastric ligament, connecting the liver to the stomach. And then there's the hepatoduodenal ligament, connecting the liver to the duodenum. And both of them start at porta hepatis of the liver. Remember that one? So the first ligament is the hepatogastric ligament, which is this one that goes from the porta hepatis of the liver to the lesser curvature of the stomach. And then we have the hepatoduodenal ligament that goes from the liver to the diaphragm. So these two are the ligaments we call the lesser omentum. And the way I like to remember it is that all the ligaments above the lesser curvature of the stomach are the lesser omentum under the liver, of course. And then all the ligaments from the greater curvature of the stomach are the greater omentum. And the greater omentum consists of three ligaments. The gastrocolic is the most important, but sources say that these three are what makes up the greater omentum. All right, but here's something interesting about these three ligaments, is that these three ligaments are a continuation of the hepatogastric ligament. So if you imagine the hepatogastric ligament of the lesser omentum attaches to the lesser curvature of the stomach, right? But then it continues on and covers the anterior and the posterior surface of the stomach. So it's still the hepatogastric ligament, right? And then it continues out from the greater curvature of the stomach as these three ligaments you see right here called the greater omentum. So the greater omentum is initially uh, formed by the hepatogastric ligament. So the first one is the gastrophrenic ligament. And remember, when you see the word phrenic, then it's related to the diaphragm. So this ligament goes from the stomach to the diaphragm. And then we have the gastrosplenic ligament. Uh, so the spleen is right here, and this ligament goes from the stomach to the spleen. Then we have the gastrocolic ligament. This one connects the stomach to the transverse colon of the large intestine. But the way it does that, the way it, it goes to the large intestine is a little bit different because it doesn't go there directly. This ligament goes in front of the intestines and then curves back and then connects with the transverse colon. So let's do that again, but we will use this model instead. This is a sagittal plane of the abdominal cavity. So the liver and the stomach are here and between them is the lesser omentum, the hepatogastric ligament, remember? And if you look closely, you will see that the lesser omentum is made up of two layers of ligaments. Because look here, the visceral peritoneum goes around the liver and forms two layers of the lesser omentum. Then they surround the stomach and keep up with me now. They continue down and once they get to the terminal line of the pelvis, which remember here is the pelvis and the terminal line of the pelvis is here. Then the peritoneum turns and attaches to the transverse colon. And it actually attaches to a specific part of the transverse colon. It attaches specifically to this right here. Remember the omental tenia, which is anteriorly located in the transverse colon? It's called the omental tenia because the greater omentum will attach to it. And so that is the greater omentum. It's the gastrocolic ligament and it consists of four layers because of this double layered fold. The greater omentum now surrounds the transverse colon and then end at another tenia called the mesocolic tenia, which is located on the backside here. It's called the mesocolic tenia because the peritoneum will go from the mesocolic tenia to the posterior abdominal wall as the transverse mesocolon. Once the transverse mesocolon gets to the posterior abdominal wall, 
it's still going to be the visceral peritoneum. It's still visceral because it's, it's going to cover the retroperitoneal organs like the pancreas and the kidneys. Now, this connection is called mesentery. The transverse mesocolon is called the mesentery. So the mesentery connects the intestines to the posterior abdominal wall. And there are two types. One is the transverse mesocolon we mentioned earlier. And the other one is related to the small intestine and the sigmoid colon. The mesentery will surround all of them and attach them to the posterior abdominal wall. And when they all meet, they will become the root of mesentery, which starts at the, uh, at the second lumbar vertebrae. So the mesentery is a visceral peritoneum that connects the intestines to the posterior abdominal wall. And I want you to keep in mind that the mesentery completely surrounds the intestines. So if you remember this picture, everything in yellow here is going to be the visceral peritoneum and everything in green is going to be the parietal peritoneum. The mesentery is this one, connecting the intestines to the posterior abdominal wall. And it surrounds the intestines and then connects them to the posterior abdominal wall, to which you will find the root of mesentery back here. The mesentery is so important in our abdominal cavity because it structurizes the organs. And between the two layers of the peritoneum, it forms a pathway for the vascular supply to go through in a very controlled manner. Now, the visceral and the parietal peritoneum will produce a serious fluid going into the peritoneal space, which is a space between the visceral and the parietal peritoneum. So, I hope this picture makes a little more sense now from the beginning of this video when you click play. The only thing you need to know now to understand the peritoneum fully is the peritoneal space. So let's go ahead and talk about that. So the peritoneal cavity has three levels. The first one is the upper level above the transverse mesocolon, as you see here. And then the middle layer lies below the transverse mesocolon, but above the terminal line of the pelvis. And then we got the lower level, which is under the terminal line, located within the lesser pelvis, as you see here in orange. Now, we're going to go through some landmarks we will find in the peritoneal cavity specific for each of these levels. These landmarks are some small spaces and openings here and there. So let's start with the upper level first. So the upper level has two recesses and one bursa. A recess is a small space between two structures, and a bursa is a sac. There's a sac below the stomach containing serous fluid, and I'll show you this in a second. The subphrenic recess is the subphrenic, meaning below the diaphragm. It's the space highlighted here. Then we have the subhepatic recess. It's subhepatic, so it's under the liver, as you see here. And then we have the omental bursa, which is this one. Another name for the omental bursa is the lesser sac, because it's a space on its own which contains serious fluid. And I'll show you what I mean. I need you to watch very closely what's about to happen now. With one pen stroke, I am able to draw across the entire cavity, but I will never be able to get to the space underneath the stomach without lifting my pen. All of this in blue is what we call the greater sac. And with one pen stroke, I am drawing the other sac, as you see here in orange. All of this is the lesser sac, or what we refer to as the omental bursa. So that is what the omental bursa is. It's a lesser sac that is separated from the greater sac. Now, what are the borders of the lesser sac? There's the lesser omentum, stomach, and the greater omentum anteriorly. And when I say the greater omentum, I mean the gastrocolic and the gastrosplenic ligaments of the greater omentum. There's the transverse colon and the transverse mesocolon inferiorly, then the liver superiorly and the parietal peritoneum posteriorly. But you will notice that these two sacs communicate. There's a hole that the serious fluid in the greater sac can flow into the lesser sac and vice versa. And this opening is called the omental foramen or the epiploic foramen, which is bordered by the vestibule of the omental bursa. So we can find some recesses here in the lesser sac as well. There's the superior recess right here. And then we have the inferior recess here. And then there's one more recess. And that is if we lift up the stomach like this, the spleen is here and the pancreas is here. This is a small recess next to the spleen called the splenic recess. So that is the apple level. Next, we have the middle level of the peritoneal cavity. Now, don't get scared by all of these names. We will break them down together. So if you take a look at this picture, these red arrows represent the flow of the serious fluid around the peritoneal cavity. And the recesses listed here on the left 
are small spaces found in various corners formed by various organs. And they're actually located behind these large organs. So let's remove the organs to see the recesses easier. Now to understand the first two recesses, we need to locate the duodenum. So this is the duodenum of the small intestine, right? The first two recesses are located on the flexure where the duodenum meets the jejunum. So here is the first recess called the superior duodenal recess and the inferior duodenal recess is right here under it. And then we have three recesses around the cecum. The first one is called the superior ileocecal recess. And if you break down the name, you'll be able to locate the position of this recess. It's located above where the ileum meets the cecum. That's why it's called the superior ileocecal recess. And then down here is the inferior ileocecal recess, under where the ileum meets the cecum. The third one is called the retrocecal recess, which is under or behind the cecum. And then finally, we have the intersigmoid recess, right behind the sigmoid column right here. So not that complicated, right? So the last thing I want to talk about in this video is the lower level of the peritoneal cavity, shown here in orange. Now females have two pouches, and males have one. And since this is a female model, we will be able to point out these recesses once we locate the uterus, the urinary bladder, and the rectum. So the recto-uterine pouch is the pouch between the rectum and the uterus, while the vesico-uterine pouch lies between the urinary bladder and the uterus, or between the vesica and the uterus, therefore vesico-uterine. And then in male, we have one pouch, since we don't have a uterus between the rectum and the urinary bladder. And this pouch is called the recto-vesical pouch. So here is the urinary bladder, and here is the rectum, and here is the pouch. That was everything I had about the peritoneum. I really hope this video made sense. If it did, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you. See you next time.